Welcome, welcome again, everybody, to the webinar Perpetrator Work Within Migrant Populations, a perspective on anti-racist and culturally sensitive approaches. Our facilitator today is Dalia Vakili. She has an, a master's degree in violence, conflict and development from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. She has been working in the humanitarian field as a gender empowerment, equality and sexual and gender-based violence advisor, specialized on refuge, refugee assistance in Lesbos as well as Sahel and MENA region. She's experienced in working with sexual and gender-based violence and human trafficking victims under heavy environments and uses an intersectional approach in her work where she aims for justice and equality for all. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, hello again and a very, very warm welcome from my side to our webinar on perpetrator work with the migrant and refugee populations and a perspective on anti-racist and cultural sensitive approaches. Anna already very kindly introduced me, but just again, I'm Dalia. I'm a researcher and I'm a trainer and a coordinator for WWP, and I'm specialized in migration, gender-based violence, and intervention work with male refugee, with a male refugee population. And uh, I have also worked quite a while in Camp Moria, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about it in Lesbos, uh, where I was mainly specialized in sexual gender-based violence, human trafficking, intervention programs with male refugees, and perpetrator work, and the work with victims of torture. So before we start, I would like to clarify the purpose of this webinar. It is mainly designed to suggest a different perspective on perpetrator work with the refugee population to offer insights on cultural sensitivity and why this could be beneficial when working with the refugee population. And of course, to collectively reflect and to brainstorm on proposals and solutions also from your side. Um, I would also like to share some general information with you. Our webinar does not provide the ultimate answers or recommendations uh, to the subject, but rather offers more like food for thought. And due to my research outcomes, the examples uh, given are relevant to refugees from the Middle East and North Africa, as well as Central Asian region. And we also hope to give an insight on cultural sensitivity and anti-racism to comprehend the background of the population. However, which is really important to say, this does not mean that violence is justified no matter the cultural background or racial struggle. And most importantly, your expertise is asked. Uh, we would love to hear from you, love to hear your input, your experiences, your reflections, and best and even worst practices. So let's see this more as a mutual learning webinar today. So according to data within the European Union between 2015 and now, it was shown that violence and displacement show a correlation as displacement causes insecurity, causes instability and uncertainty, which often results in frustration, in aggression and violent behavior and even an increase in gender-based violence. It can also destabilize or shift traditional gender roles, which can increase levels of toxic masculinity and eventually lead to different forms of violence, of which women are often the ultimate victims. So during my research, uh, which was throughout 2019 and also this year, I distributed surveys and held several focus groups and interviews with professionals who work in the field of gender-based violence and also in the work of perpetrator work and migration. And according to the results, it is stated that we need to consider the stress factors of refugees and migrant men in order to comprehend the target group better. So these stress factors can come from trauma, they can come from survival, homelessness, from prostitution and other eventual factors that are connected to their displacement. And uh, the experts also stated that male refugees and migrants need to be approached in appropriate ways based on their individual history. Therefore, it is crucial to understand the biography of the traumatic events and the actual stress factors, such as unemployment, shelter living, racism, language barriers, miscommunication, and violence in itself. And another proposal is, <clears throat> excuse me, that their social situation needs to be considered in the end and regarded as well. Therefore, this um, webinar is giving you um, 
an insight into the cultural and racial dynamic when working with perpetrators and the migration population. However, before we dive deeper into it, it is important to consider that the problematic discourse, when it comes to the, uh, it's important to, exactly, to consider that the term culture can be a problematic discourse in itself. So firstly, assuming that gender-based violence is happening due to the culture of the target group is highly problematic due to reasons of prejudice, eventual discrimination, but also because it can easily shift into the opposite direction, that culture can be accidentally seen as a justification for domestic violence, especially in this very, very sensitive topic of perpetrator work. Therefore, we need to find a balance between being cultural sensitive, culturally sensitive, and also not being misled. And secondly, and importantly, the term culture often drifts into stigmatization and creates a racial power dynamic between the people of concern and us as facilitators. So now this leads us to the question on how we can address gender-based violence without blaming it on non-Western cultures. We need to avoid referring uh, to Western culture as an ideal to minimize the participants' resistance and reduce fear of stigmatization and marginalization. And we also need to avoid um, Western um, or Eurocentric uh, superiority by giving the participants ownership to goal setting. This will enhance their identification with the intervention program. I have an example for you. So Ahmed uh, is in charge of a perpetrator intervention program with Mir refugees. In this program, he includes the participants in the goal setting and asks them individually what they would like to achieve at the end of the program. And then he plans together with the participants on how to achieve their goals within the time frame of the program. Uh, he uses an inclusive approach in which he gives the participants ownership of the process uh, to step out of the perpetrator cycle. So this would be an example of how to give ownership. Uh, the next point would be the question whether we should include religious or community leaders in the perpetrator program, and if yes, how we could do it. Now, I agree with, with uh, probably most of you that we should stick to secular approaches. However, being a secularist with Muslim background myself, and based on my own experiences when working with perpetrators from the Middle East and Central Asian region, it could be beneficial to eventually consider that religion often plays a major role and very influ influential role in their lives based on attitude, based on their behavior and their values, which is why perpetrator programs can eventually consider including religious leaders to address the topic or even raise awareness on it. I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts on it because it's quite a difficult um, topic. So the question is now, how would we do that? How could we start? So first of all, we need to ensure that the religious leaders we aim to work with support domestic violence prevention and that they have progressive views on gender roles and therefore we should recruit representatives of these community-based and religious institutions via specific uh, consultation methods. Secondly, uh, we should offer training programs for these religious leaders on perpetrator programs. And thirdly, we should ensure that training programs cover laws and regulations on gender-based violence, gender equality, and violence prevention. The reason why I suggest um, religious leaders is that I actually um, used uh, religious leaders for LGBTQ normalization and awareness. Now, many of you probably think, what? <laughs> That's insane. But uh, we do have um, these kind of religious leaders, especially based in Berlin, who are in support of the queer community, the queer Muslim community. And it actually did help to, to facilitate um, the whole normalization process with those who had a very homophobic stance, especially um, cisgendered men. So this is why I suggest this for the, um, for the perpetrator program. But we can discuss about that later on. So now another option would be the community-based approach where uh, one could work closely in uh, perpetrator programs with community leaders. And these community leaders have a kind of a role model function in their community. They can be recruited in refugee housing and um, tra in tra trained perpetrator intervention programs. 
also community leaders can um, aid gender-based violence prevention by raising awareness in the community and facilitators should set goals for the intervention together with the community leaders and address the um, specific needs, the challenges and required changes by listening and also by understanding the realities and the needs of these specific communities. So another example would be the uh, SASA method. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard about it. Um, in Uganda, the so-called SASA method is used as a community-based approach to end gender-based violence from within. In this approach, community members set goals to balance power relations through uh, specific activi activities. For instance, community members are selected as volunteers and they get support from facilitators to gain confidence through encouragement and critical thinking of patriarchal patterns. And through these methods, the community um, activists can then raise awareness within their own community, foster positive change and create sustainability in gender-based violence prevention. So now the next question would be, what are appropriate training methods facilitators need when working with a migrant and refugee populations? For that, uh, I recommend that um, they need gender-based violence training on migrant populations. I highly recommend the uh, GBV training of UNHCR, um, training on appropriate and effective referral pathways and systems of care, um, how we use these uh, referral pathways with the specific uh, population, ethical and safety issues, uh, planning design tools and implementation methods, intercultural sensitivity, which we will talk about a bit more detailed later on, and anti-racism program, which will be part of this presentation. Another point would be to look at the benefits of having facilitators with migration background, um, which I am myself as well. I'm half Iranian, half Palestinian, born and raised in Germany. Um, I believe that um, the facilitation might be better received by refugees when delivered by someone with a similar um, ethnic background. It can create a feeling of safety and also a feeling of understanding and enhance cultural uh, bridge building. And um, community awareness and education and accountability for abuse and violence prevention can therefore be conveyed more effectively um, because a facilitator can be viewed as a role model, as already mentioned in the community-based approach. And this role model function can uh, aid them to hold perpetrators responsible and also to support them uh, for positive change and to deviate from further uh, gender-based violence. So now we continue with the topic of cultural sensitivity. So before I dive deeper into it, um, let's I'll take a moment and reflect on this question. Um, I invite you to, to, to answer the question, to give your input. What does cultural sensitivity mean to you? If anyone would love to contribute something. So the definition says that cultural sensitivity um, creates space for people to share their differences and restores a sense of humanity to those who have already lost so much. Okay, um, I would continue now. So, so um, now this leads us uh, to the question, why is culturally sensitive work important when working with male refugees? Um, it improves the communication with the target group, especially when it comes to sensitive topics such as perpetrator work, gender-based violence, and so on. It creates a better trust dynamic between the person of concern and the facilitator. Therefore, you can actually create a safe and a brave space with the person of concern. It helps avoid miscommunication, of course, and it can help to reduce the fear of marginalization or stigmatization of the person that you are working with. So proposed strategies for culturally sensitive work with the migrant population are, of course, language, um, the interpretation um, needs to be um, helped by someone who is, who is trained and um, culturally and linguistically uh, appropriate, of course. And this person should not come from their direct community. 
Um, I'm saying this because in Moria we have used many cultural mediators that came from that other community. I really support using, um, of course, our working with um, cultural mediators uh, from the refugee community, but we need to be careful that it's not from their direct environment or community because you know they're discussing sensitive topics and of course they shut down. Um, access to care, so communicate health and social services by considering cultural taboos, um, for instance, sexual health uh, would be one point, and stigmas that prevent them from seeking the services, also psychological health, which is a massive stigma, mostly in the Middle Eastern culture, and also to comprehend cultural and traditional practices, to understand their um, important traditions and religious practices, uh, such as Ramadan, for example, that can may influence the working days um, or the hours with the men. And to consider that um, it might be challenging uh, to discuss uh, certain cultural practices. Um, so we really need to, again, um, create a safe and a brave space beforehand with these men. So um, when aiming to work in culturally competent, in a culturally competent manner, it is important to look at the different levels of practices. There is, of course, the individual practice. Um, I wrote a few examples uh, for that. So Stephen acquired a set, a set of attitude, knowledge, and skills after years of experience that he can use efficiently while working with different ethnic groups of the migration population. Organizational practice would be for instance, Refugee Aid is an organization that implemented attitudes, behaviors, and policies within their staff members that enables them to work efficiently with different cultural populations. And then there is the societal practice, which we hopefully all want to achieve. Um, for instance, Sweden developed a system in which policies uh, value ethnic and cultural diversity. School systems implement culturally sensitive classes that include refugees in workplaces and require intercultural competencies. So to acquire a cultural competence, we need to constantly check on ourselves and check on our own biases and prejudice, which I will dive deeper into in, in the anti-racist uh, part. So, uh, which brings us to the core skills, um, which are, of course, empathy, um, the self-determination of the people that we're working with, ownership, in order for them to, um, to identify with the process of the program, openness and responsiveness from your side as a facilitator, especially when it comes to their struggle and needs. Sorry. Um, furthermore, it's important to look at the cultural uh, communication skills, um, to, which are to extend the knowledge uh, of, on the culture of refugees, which uh, you guys already stated so brilliantly that it's actually amazing to do your own research, but also to work with people from that culture, eventually with cultural mediators who can give you uh, a deeper insight. Um, attentive listening to their needs and uh, to their struggle, that is of course correlating with the displacement um, to recognize their discomfort when it comes to challenging topics and to understand uh, verbal and non-verbal cues. Uh, the next point would be to look at the cross-cultural work with cultural mediators. So um, cultural mediators need to be well informed on the topics um, that are being discussed, especially when they're that sensitive, like perpetrator work. Um, Cultural media mediators also need to be briefed on culturally challenging words, such, such as sexual terms, for instance, because they often cannot be literally translated into the target language. I made the experience myself. I have worked once as a cultural mediator myself. There are so many expressions that don't exist, uh, especially in, in Farsi and also in Arabic. Um, so this really needs to be considered and therefore um, you as a facilitator need to find a middle ground with a cultural mediator in semantics beforehand. So you can make sure that everything is communicated the right way and nothing gets lost, but also in a culturally appropriate way. So which brings us to the point of uh, prior guidelines and also boundaries that cultural mediators need to consider. So um, of course they need to translate without altering or adding anything um, to what the target group is communicating. They need to be impartial. 
Um, I know it sounds for many of us like, hey, this is a given, but I have experienced many, many times that that was not a given and that this disrupted the flow of the facilitation, um, especially when it came to the topics of gender-based violence. Therefore, I really, really recommend prior training of the cultural mediators' uh, confidentiality, which uh, is highly important, and therefore I would like to remind you again not to use anyone from the direct community and uh, to refrain from imposing and giving advice. Um, I made this experience also many, many times that uh, advice um, has been imposed without me actually giving that advice as a facilitator myself, which of course brought a lot of chaos in the process. So this needs to be prior discussed uh, with who you work with. Okay. So now comes the anti-racism part um, and why we should consider this in perpetrator work. So before we start, I would kindly invite you with an open mind uh, to get comfortable to be uncomfortable as this is quite a sensitive topic and might be a bit, a bit confrontational. Um, if you want, uh, please have a pen and paper ready and um, reflect on the questions that I will be asking throughout the presentations, just for yourself, but if you want to share them afterwards, um, I, would, uh, I would absolutely love that. But this is just for yourself to, to later on reflect and maybe continue the work on anti-racism after this uh, webinar. So, uh, firstly, I would like to discuss the goals of this section. However, as a disclaimer, once again, <clears throat> excuse me, this section does not suggest to justify the violence of perpetrators due to their racial struggle, but rather gives us a perspective to understand racial dynamics and how it can affect perpetrator work within the migrant population, especially coming from a facilitator towards the person of concern. So um, it's to challenge your own bias towards male refugees, especially perpetrators uh, with refugee background, and also to challenge your own racial power dynamic um, as a facilitator, and also to explore your own bias and your own experience of race and culture in your own professional behavior. So what's the importance of anti-racism training? Um, when you work with refugees, you need to consider that almost all of them have experienced racism in their lives. And this counts actually for all black indigenous people of color. Whether this racism is mild or severe, it happens. You also need to consider that power dynamics always take place when you work with someone who is of refugee background due to their status and their race. And not recognizing this can disrupt the flow of the work you do. Also, we all need to look at our own biases and how they eventually affect our work. I will dive deeper into this later. So the first point I want to discuss is the difference between being non-racist and being anti-racist. Many of us, and hopefully all of us today, can confidently say that we are non-racist. However, many of us are, however, the question is now, how many of us are truly anti-racist? We need to understand that racism is multi-layered and that the basic definition that describes racism um, as hateful treatment against other races um, needs to be understood that racism appears in uh, systemic structures, which can be employment, which can be housing, healthcare, socioeconomic disparities, which can be criminal justice as well, which can be education, and especially refugees and migrants. So those that are displaced and the undocumented, those that have difficult political statuses, suffer from these systemic layers of racism, even in a complete, um, in a more intense way, I would argue. So the first point I want to discuss is the difference between being non-racist and being anti-racist. So, being non-racist, I have an example written out for you. So Stephen believes that all humans are the same, uh, have the same right to be respected and tolerated. He does not discriminate nor hate people based on their ethnic or, um, or any other background. Uh, Leila is actively doing work to combat racism. Um, she addresses organizational structures, attitudes, and policies at her workplace. So what's the difference between the two of them, between Stephen and Leila? 
Stephen may not be actively racist, which is great. However, he is complicit in benefiting from privileges that are given to him because of systemic racism. So these are the major differences that we need to keep in mind throughout the process of this webinar. So how can we become anti-racist? What you see here are different zones in the process of becoming anti-racist. Um, so moving from the fear zone to the learning zone means that um, you grow your knowledge and awareness on racial inequality and reflect your own personal role that may uncover how you benefited from this system. Um, this also requires uh, active listening to people of color uh, and to the refugees and people of concern that you're working with. And moving to the growth zone is often considered, uh, I would say, uncomfortable part um, because this mainly requires you to question your own bias, uh, your own position and participation in racism. Once you reach the growth zone, you are aware of racial inequality and uh, your own role of white privilege in our society. And from that moment on, you hopefully can start with meaningful action to actually make a change in our society. Which leads us to the question, how can we be anti-racist when working with refugees? We need to comprehend our privileges. We need to comprehend the roots of our privileges and the impact of our privileges on marginalized uh, communities. And we need to actively challenge racist systems, even the invisible ones around us. So we need to avoid white silence and white apathy in that sense. We need to examine our own conscious and our um, and unconscious bias, which many of us have. I would even argue all of us, even me as a person of color, because it's part of uh, you know our upbringing and the societies that we grew up in in the systemic uh, environment and we need to stop being defensive um this point is actually in my opinion one of the most important ones to to derive from fragility and and to be open to get uncomfortable in, in that topic and in certain situations so now the question is, uh, what is systemic racism? Many of you probably recognize these terms uh, as they popped up um, more frequently this year, actually, due to the Black Lives Matter movement. However, what many do not consider is that um, systemic racism concerns all people of color, and especially those that are displaced and undocumented. So it refers to systems in place that perpetuate racial injustice. It can occur in our most fundamental structures. So where we live, the quality of healthcare, how likely it is for us to face violent policing, um, and how politics speaks of us. So these factors of systemic racism are um, usually cause and effect of white privilege. Whenever I mention the term white privilege to workers who work within the migra uh, migration population, um, the initial reaction is a slight cringe. And many people, especially from the NGO sector, tend to disassociate themselves from these terms. The question is now why? Let me break these two words down for you. So the word white makes most people uncomfortable because they have never been described or defined by their race before. Because whiteness is the societal term in, in movies and supermarkets when it comes, for instance, hair products, um, in advertisement, everything around us. And the word privilege creates discomfort amongst uh, lower working classes. Why? Because they, dis uh, because they associate with, uh, because they can't associate with uh, economic privilege. Um, there's this... If there's a saying I often bring into the discourse which, say, which says that you can be white and poor, but you cannot be white, uh, but you cannot be poor because you are white, uh, which, which often, um, yeah, describes uh, these kind of situations where, where people say, but I am not privileged. Um, white privilege is both a legacy and a cause of racism. It's really important to acknowledge that um, it became part of our daily lives and is normalized and, and it's almost invisible to those who actually benefit from that privilege. 
And it's part of um, systemic structures in our society, as mentioned before. So now let us try to understand what it means to be a male refugee in a Western world. How does the world perceive you? Male refugees are more likely to be randomly selected, interrogated, and searched by the police because they appear to them as suspicious. And male refugees are often refused housing by landlords because of their asylum status and country of origin, even if they can provide the financial resources. I can say that about Germany. There are many cases of that in Germany and also about Greece that I had to experience. Male refugees are often um, denied entry in night nightclubs and bars and are therefore excluded from uh, social activities. And um, personal faults or missteps are um, most likely used to deny opportunity or compassion and are even demonized in the media, which makes it difficult for them to strive for change and to improve. Um, if refugees are accused of a crime, the likelihood of them being presumed guilty uh, prior to the trial is very likely, and male refugees are often denied psychological assistance, um, symptoms of PTSD are disregarded as they are not categorized as urgent vulnerable groups. This often happens in the reception areas. I experienced that a lot, that we had to deny actually hundreds of men psychological uh, support because they were not seen as urgent enough. And this often resulted in chaos and in violence as these men suffered from immense PTSD. Now, many of us already work, who already work with refugees um, might think, okay, why are you telling us these facts? We already know. What do they have to do with perpetrator work? And why are you laying them out now? So this is why I would kindly remind you that um, this whole presentation is to understand the target group better and to understand our own power dynamics, which leads us to talk about white exceptionalism. So what is white exceptionalism and how can it affect our work when we work with the migrant population? It's the belief that you are exempt from the effects and benefits of white supremacy and therefore anti-racism does not apply to you as you know enough, because you see themselves as one of the good ones. For instance, as you do the work and you support uh, in your work and, and you're not racist. Um, it's a belief that you are special because you're not racist and therefore you don't need to dig deeper, you don't need to collect information, you don't need to ask, you don't need to listen. And it's the urge to respond with uh, the famous sentence, not all white people, when refugees or people of color um, complain about, <clears throat> excuse me, their experiences in their daily day-to-day -day racism that they experience and their struggles that are caused by systemic racism. <clears throat> excuse me. So let us reflect for a moment. Um, this reflection is of course, for yourself, but if anyone would like to talk about it uh, in the group, uh, I would uh, kind of, I would happily invite that. So uh, think back to your childhood. How did society teach you white exceptionalism? Were you told that it's enough to be just a nice person and to treat everyone respectfully, or or did society or teachers or parents or our close environment tell us, hey? You need to actively do the work to make a change. So what was your own experience with that? There's also a quote, if you, if you believe you are exceptional, you will not do the work. And if you do not do the work, you will continue to do harm, even if it's not your intention. Actually, I believe it comes, there was an amazing um, speech of Martin, Martin Luther King on, on, on that um, topic. You can maybe look it up later. It gives a very interesting uh, reflection on white exceptionalism. Does anyone would like to contribute something or shall we continue? Maybe we can also reflect on a sentence and that is one sentence that I um, recently reflected on because uh, even though I'm a person of color, there's still structures of colorism and I am not exempt from being racist since you know, I can be racist towards However, black people, for instance, so it's really important, it was really important for me to reflect on 
this sentence actually, what makes me believe that I'm one of the good ones? So I would love to invite you guys to reflect on that sentence too. That was actually an eye opener for me. I think it's really interesting, the sentence that you just said. Uh, actually, I'm not letting anybody, if you want to share, post a plus in the chat or on mute and say hi, but I'm just going to talk for a moment as well. <laughs> um, I always thought I was a good person. I was one of the good people because I always said, oh, I'm so empathetic. And I like, I feel like I can feel basically what anybody is going through. And I thought that made me like a really good person. And then after a certain time in my life, I came to the point where I realized that I can't feel what everybody is going through. And I might have absolutely no idea how somebody feels about something. And that I really have to step out of my own experience and kind of what you said, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and realizing that other people have experiences that I in my life couldn't imagine. And I think that was like a really like, whoa, <laughs> moment for me. Yeah. Yes. Very good point. Thank you, Anna. It's very true. I mean, this is something I am learning to reflect on as well. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Um, if nobody wants to contribute something now, um, I will continue, but uh, feel free to raise a hand in between or at the end of this to contribute because I, I love your contributions. Thank you, guys. So um, many of us have heard of the sentence before, I do not see color. It's a well-meaning sentence. I have heard it many times before towards me too, but it always rubbed me the wrong way. So the question is now, why do we actually need to see color, especially when we work with uh, um, male refugee population? So when you claim that you don't see color, it means that you're also blind to the struggle that these refugees deal with due to their political status and due to their race. And it is an act of minimization and erasure of the impact of their skin color, of the political status, and existence within a system of white supremacy. It's a system that we all, most of all, I guess all in this uh, group I live in, and uh, some of us benefit and some of us uh, not so much. And when you claim to be colorblind, you're also avoiding to look at your own race, uh, if you're white, um, which means that you're blind to your own privilege, which is problematic and, of course, will interrupt the process of improvement and change. So another reflection, maybe, um, and I would love to hear from you guys. How do you feel when you hear the terms white people? Does it make you uncomfortable? Does it make you feel attacked? Um, do you disassociate from it? What emotions come up when you hear people referring to others or to you as white? Anyone wants to contribute? Or if not? Dania, just jumping in to let you know that we have 10 minutes left, which doesn't mean that people aren't welcome to share. I just wanted to let you know. Okay, perfect. I'm almost done, actually. <laughs> so, but if, yeah, okay. So if nobody wants to contribute, it would be nice um, if you would uh, reflect on it for a moment for yourself. I, I personally found it very helpful. Okay, so being colorblind also makes us not see societal stereotyping of male refugees and hinder us from challenging our own bias. So male refugees um, often face different types of stigmatization that are connected with their race, but also with their status in displacement. So it can be, the stereotypes could be that they are lazy, that they're sexist, that they're perverts, that they're uh, non-compromising, that they're criminals, um, religious, and so on. And why do we need to understand what the stereotypes are? We need to understand it because racist stereotypes are used by policymakers, by politicians, and the media to justify the ill treatment of refugees. They can even be used by uh, our own workplace and uh, also within the premise of NGOs, um, which I sadly have to experience many times I am in the humanitarian field in crisis areas. 
So now I would like to discuss another very invisible factor when working with refugees, and this is called white saviorism. Now I know that perpetrator work is a very sensitive topic in itself, and these people need to change in their behavior <clears throat> not to cause more harm to their victims. However, what we often do not realize is when we work from a racially privileged position that we can disrupt this process of improvement through our own behavior. So what is white saviorism? Um, oh, sorry. So what is white saviorism? It's the idea that refugees are inferior uh, in their cap capability, in their intelligence and, and self-determination, and therefore we, they need saving. Uh, in their helplessness from, from white people, from aid workers, social workers, and so on. And it's also that well-meaning white workers or facilitators um, who, as it says, mean well, but they don't have any understanding of historical or cultural, or religious or social background, and therefore they impose a Eurocentric or, uh, or Western standards on the refugees without even listening to their background or to their needs, which makes them shut down most of the time. So what is white saviorism in action? It's the habit to speak, decide on behalf of the refugees' needs and program development instead of asking them about what their goals and needs are and give them ownership in the process. Now, I know that in um, perpetrator work, we need to guide the process. However, it would be beneficial for the participants to be able to identify with the process through mutual goal setting for their improvement. Um, yes, so, and it's also um, the habit to speak or decide on their behalf and um, that refugees are from underdeveloped countries and therefore treat them as underdeveloped individuals to implement programs without uh, the input of cultural mediators, for instance, or people with the same cultural background. Um, and uh, facilitators who don't have the cultural uh, knowledge and to believe that you are the voice of the voiceless. So um, what are the first steps to combat anti-racist behavior in my role when I work with the refugee population? It's important that you reflect on your own bias. When you ask yourself, uh, what values um, do I hold to hinder my ability to practice anti-racism? And to be honest uh, with your own prejudice, even, they, even though it can be very uncomfortable, and stereotyping about male refugees, and to list them, to confront them, and to eventually and hopefully change them and to give leadership of intervention programs to professionals who are people of color, people with uh, the same background, like the people of concern that you work with, to avoid a Eurocentric context and white saviorism and to work through agenda, to the agenda, the content of the program with the input of cultural mediators or individuals who actually have the cultural knowledge. So how can we implement anti-racism in our organization? We need to create a brave space where team members can exchange honest feelings on this topic um, through conversation, um, to comprehend our own power dynamics um, between us and, um, and the population that we work with, and yeah, to provide our, your team members with material on cultural sensitivity, personal biases, empathy work. Um, you can reach out to me if you want some literature and that I'm happy to share. Um, via email uh, to create sustainability by ongoing learning on long-term transformation and to also measure your, your improvements uh, within your own um, organization and the milestones. Yeah, acknowledge the milestones and um, transform them into daily practices. So um, how can we develop um, our organization's cultural competency? Uh, for instance, we can reach out to organizations that are specialized in refugee support and diversity to get their input and uh, to have a mutual learning seminar with them, to get in touch with refugee facilities, housing, and cooperate with social workers or even community leaders from, uh, from these communities, and uh, to work together with cultural mediators on program development, as I said before, and to sign up for more extensive and detailed um, anti-racism webinars.
And yeah, here are some helpful resources, but I'm also really happy to share them with you afterwards if you have any questions or would like to have some.